making life worth living and retirement with having is really about the people in our lives. It's about the people we care for. It's about the people we love. It's about the people that make us happy. It's about the people who know what is right and what is wrong with the world. It's about the people who know what is truth and the people who don't. You see, there's a wonderful comedian and super speaker, national man who's written many books and has some wonderful books out now because someone took a look at his old stuff and decided to help him with his new stuff, and that was great. He does use the same shtick at some times, but he's also very good at what he talks about, and he talks about there's true and then there's truth. And I love that about Andy Andrews. He really does know those things, and I met him long ago in a networking organization that he used to be a leader within before he became a world-famous author with the likes of people like Dr. John Maxwell and others who write loving works like he does. He tells a good story on the stage, and he literally came to present at one of my networking conventions that I visited and attended with my mother and one of her good friends. Now, my mother is in her, 80, in her late 80s, and that's okay. She's at the jumping off point is what a lot of times people think about is that when you're late in life, they called you elderberries in churches and they literally think that it's not important to talk to you about God and I have to disagree. You see, in life, we have moments of time to prove that we are a child of God, whether we are literally two years old or whether we are literally 90 years old. The only way to know is if we're doing literally the right thing by the laws within the commandments, within the Bible, within the tenets, within the verses, within the things that we hold near and dear. The problem is that people today pick and choose what they want to find important in the Bible, and they don't always receive a lot of guidance in how to go about picking those verses. They will take a few verses that talk about something that was centuries and eons ago and try to apply it to the present day, and it doesn't really fly well. It doesn't fly well in the face of people who don't believe in that particular part of the passage, but also it doesn't fly well sometimes with the Lord, because we have to look at it this way. The human race evolves over time. It evolves over time in terms of its society, in terms of its understanding, in terms of its education, in terms of its intellect, in terms of its technology, in terms of its adaptability, in terms of its opportunities in life. It evolves because the Lord says it's time for that to evolve. You see, it's not that men are so dumb, it's that God is so smart. And when we talk like this, we're really talking about the magic of the Lord. You see, the magic of the Lord can move people to do the right thing, and the mayhem of God is not something that we talk about. You see, the mayhem is usually what people produce. People produce mayhem by the lies they tell themselves about the rights they have in other people's lives to judge, to dishonor, to discredit, and to apply biblical verses to parts of a human being that they are not the Lord over to do so. You see, the crazy aspect of what's going on across the land right now is people are trying to dishonor other people's rights. We literally have a presidential house that is trying to say to people, my taxes are not important to you, but your genitals are important to me. Now that's a bold and brash statement for any lay pastor to say out there, but that's literally what I'm observing. That's what I'm hearing from my friends in other states, and that's literally something that we see tweeted about regularly by famous stars who are out of sorts over what's going on in Georgia and other places where people, humans, men in particular of religious stint, are trying to take away a human being's right over their own privacy, of their own body, of their own health care, of their own choices in life, of their own responsibilities to some of those instantaneous moments where they didn't make a necessarily a wise choice or they just didn't have the opportunity to because passion availed. Now, when I talk like this, you know dang well what I'm talking about, but I'm talking about the reality of if there's a person who literally thinks that they know the Lord's plan for someone else, by and then by all means get out there on the public stage like some of the other prophets and mediums and spiritualists and let us know. You see, there's been all those people throughout the entire history of the world, and yet we have churches and pastors that don't literally believe in the Holy Spirit at all. They talk about the Trinity as if it exists, but they don't know how to measure it. They don't know how to explain it. They don't know how to produce it. They don't know how to evaluate it. They don't know how to show it, and they certainly rarely represent it in their own abilities. You see, I've stood in front of many pastors saying, I'm homeless. I have these simple priorities for the day. And I've literally left churches starving because the pastor was so in tune with his own self and so out of tune with the person standing in front of him, literally representing Christ in a way that he didn't understand that I hadn't eaten breakfast for the morning. I've literally left churches without one person saying, hey, I get you're going through a challenge. I just want to make sure, did you get a chance to eat today? Have you had enough water intake for your body's nutrients? It's so rare for that to happen. 
And I've gone back once or twice when the Lord bid me to, to some places that I pretty much scolded online for their lack of care. I still had one pastor lie about the whole process when I talked with him by telephone and told him what my challenge was and what I needed help with. He was literally going to an event with a bunch of guys for the church he represents, and he didn't even bother to think about inviting someone who was interested in attending his church, of getting more involved in his church, who he supposedly welcomed to participate in his church. So what we learned, it was all lip service. He also insisted that he loved to make sure that I had food for the day, but he didn't offer anything. He offered a gift card for Walmart, which is great, but how was he supposed to produce it for me if he was leaving to go to an eating event with the men at his church? You see, there's dichotomy in this world, and we definitely see that all the time. I've stood in front of men who are like, you know, we don't do a lot with that. And I've said, may I speak to your organization about this topic so that people understand more and more how homelessness occurs, more and more how poverty impacts people's nutrients and what they gather into the intake of their bodies to protect their souls. And openly, I get literally blank stares, deers and headlights. It's like they're so busy in their own kingdom of I'm a pastor of this church and I will go on forever that they don't really think about their own retirement and whether or not they will have enough for retirement, let alone whether or not they will be living in poverty like many of the people in their congregation that they don't even recognize, that they don't even know, may not have enough food on their table for the week. And the only meal sometimes that people get on a Sunday is if a church is putting on a spread after the service, which really is what they used to do in the old fellowship halls. They would literally have 60-60 club or these uh, late uh, potluck dinners where everybody would bring something and nobody left hungry and everybody went home with leftovers who needed them. You see, we're so out of control over we feed animals, literally our pets, our dogs, our cats, over taking care of local people. It's sort of out of control. You see, there are plenty of verses in the Bible that talk about taking care of the impoverished, the elderly, and people who have nothing, but there's definitely verses in the Bible that says, look, if your brother is this in homelessness, you should be providing him a place. Yet churches are sort of leery of getting into driving people places and the buses that they have, there's insurance. And so these little vans and buses and, and luxury items sit on their property and they're not utilized at all. They become just a sort of large billboard sign for them. And there are a few vans I've seen roaming around the community that are literally of the church of the woman that I love, but I've never seen anybody else in them. I don't know what they're utilized for. I don't know if they pick up food from Kroger's and distribute them to their food pantries, which is wonderful. But what do those vans do during the rest of the week? Are they literally sitting empty or are they allowing a family to get out of the cold and rain to sit in the back of those vans without a home? You see, there's all different ways to produce a proof that you love God, but there's another way completely. Not only are you feeding people, but you're also allowing them shelter. And when a church door is locked at the front and there's videotapes on every room and there's really no place for a person to sit down and worship God in their own spiritual way, it's sort of outlandish, isn't it? I mean, our goal is to, when we go to church is to find the Lord there in the house. And how do we find the Lord in a house? It's usually through the sermon. It's through the touch points that are provided and shared. And it's through the people who literally say that they walk with faith. When I visited a church recently, I was given more than enough a welcome. I was able to get a little bit for lunch because they had one of these little fellowship events afterwards, which was lovely. But then when I poured lemonade, things came out of the faucet of that lemonade that shouldn't have been there because I bet you nobody thought to wash out the thing before they mixed the lemonade in it again. You see, that's the problem with volunteer staff is that they don't always think about doing things the way that your mama might have taught you, which is you always wash something before you utilize it again, just because you never knew whether it was washed well or what animals or insects or anything might have crawled across it in the time that it's literally been in storage in a place where literally you've got rat traps outside of a building. Now, when I talk like this, I'm talking about every place because even the local library has a rat trap outside the, the place, which is kind of odd because there's not really a lot of food here in this place. But what I'm really talking about is whether or not you're living your life for the Lord. Are you literally doing things that are righteous? Are you trying to help someone? Are you trying to insult someone? And I just had someone lay back to me a comment about something that I'm pretty sure I didn't talk to her about. But she would have gotten out of a PowerPoint that would have been in my bag that is now missing from my bag and parts of things are gone. You see, when people pretend they didn't do things, they really did do things because I find items of mine sort of must over and put in different pockets like someone had to quickly put things back together. And it's annoying as hell because I don't get into your pants pockets. 
I literally don't get into your baggage and I certainly wouldn't even ever dream of doing so unless you gave me explicit permission and you told me exactly where to look. Most men don't want to look through a woman's purse. They certainly don't want their own briefcase muddled through. And most people want to have a telephone that's private. When we talk about real issues, when we talk about real things, we're talking about the political climate of today. Do we really want the government in our health care? Do we really want the president looking over our genitals? Do we really want the administration deciding who we can and can't make love to? I don't think so. I think we're in a situation of a generation that is sort of tired of all that overkill and literally wants to tell him to go fly a kite, but they're not sure how, they're not sure when, they're not sure why, but that's not true. They just realize that he's so powerful that you could get harmed in the process. Now, openly, I'm not saying the man threatens people, but I would imagine that he's got his own retaliation service when he gets things not done the way he wants them to. Now, in life, we have moments of time to make all the difference in the world for people. There's always going to be some monster out there who thinks they have control and rights in someone else's life, and they really don't. The Lord makes every single soul out there. The Lord puts interest in their mind. It pr produces love in their heart, and openly, that love lasts forever if the Lord put it there. There's nothing that can deter it. No amount of conversation will stop it. And most people sort of know that kind of love from their own experiences. Not at all, but for seeing it in movies, sure, maybe. Now in life, we've got moments of time to make all the difference for someone. You can either sit there and think this guy's off his rocker for talking with God all the time, or you can really recognize that a man has gone through a transformative process because a woman he loves showed him a tool that she discovered. And literally, he's mastered it to the point that he doesn't even have to look at it to utilize it. But the truth is, I lay down everything that I want in life before the Lord. And if the Lord willing, if the people he chooses for me to meet do, do their job, then I'll have everything I need to move on in life. Thanks for listening. I hope you find something in what I've said for your own life and that you can put your own self into the stories that I reveal and openly that you will get all that you desire in life. Thanks for listening.